the Reform Subcommittee. It's just under two hours. Uh, joining us in a few moments. Uh, the Subcommittee on Civil Service and Agency Organization will come to order. Two years ago, the federal government saw its largest reorganization since the end of World War II with the creation of the Homeland Security Department, which involved the merger of 22 existing agencies and 180,000 employees into one mammoth cabinet department. Today, this subcommittee begins its examination of how the rest of the government is structured and whether the existing structure needs reorganization on a much smaller scale. We begin this process by focusing on one aspect of the federal government that touches our everyday life, how the government inspects food. Right now, there are more than a dozen federal agencies that enforce more than 35 food safety laws, creating such illogical situations as the Food and Drug Administration having responsibility for inspecting closed-faced meat sandwiches, while the U.S. Department of Agriculture is in charge of inspecting open-faced meat sandwiches. Or if you prefer, the FDA is in charge of cheese pizzas, while the USDA has jurisdiction over pepperoni pizzas. And here's one more. The FDA inspects both beef soup and chicken broth, but USDA inspects chicken soup and beef broth. In case you didn't get that, it's reversed. As the old saying goes, you can't make this stuff up. This situation did not happen overnight, but it's the result of piecemeal legislation solutions crafted over the years. It is a good example of why every once in a while, Congress needs to take a step back and look at the whole picture to see if there is some rearranging that should take place. In this instance, one possible solution that some have raised is to consolidate all the food inspection programs under a single agency. We're going to hear testimony today on that subject, as well as the other organizational issues facing food inspection programs. Regardless of the organizational ideas offered here today, I want to emphasize out the, at the outset that everyone in this room is in agreement that we want our food supply to be safe. So that is not an issue. I thank our witnesses for being here, and I look forward to the discussion. We've been joined now by uh, Ms. Holmes Norton, and I'm going to recognize you. Do you have an opening statement? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I, <clears throat> I want to especially thank you for calling this hearing uh, by the subject of vital importance to the American people. Uh, especially in uh, recent uh, years and months. Some of us thought that Mad Cow would never make its way, uh, for example, to the United States. Some of us thought it was only a matter of time. Um, I grew up thinking that the food supply of the United States was uh, impenetrable. Uh, we have learned different. We have just finished a major reorganization uh, the largest reorganization uh, since World War II uh, uh, of the Homeland Security Agencies. I'm on the Homeland Security Committee. I was on the two main committees uh, that considered most of the legislation that resulted in the department. Uh, as much as it is apparent that this set of blocks doesn't make much sense, uh, about the easiest thing to do, uh, we've learned, is to say that what it takes to cure a problem is to simply reorganize it. Um, I happen to be a big fan of reorganizations because I believe in rational structures. When I headed a, f a federal agency, one of the first things we did was to reorganize the agency, reconfigure it to better do its job, and I do believe that it, it, it worked. Uh, but we are still very much in a load learning mode when it comes to the Department of Homeland Security. Huge disruptions and disquiet uh, has uh, resulted in some parts of the agency that we learn are far worse off than they were before, such as processing of immigration uh, claims. Uh, perhaps there are other parts that are better. Uh, I, I, and I, I, I do hope before we jump in again with both feet that we learn from that experience, and I certainly hope we learn from the experience uh, that employees have had where we have disrupted uh, the way in which employees relate to the agencies from which they came. 
uh, thrown out many of their civil service and collective bargaining rights all in the name of reorganization. It does seem to me one can reorganize without uh, that kind of penalty and disruption. Finally, let me say that uh, the cause of the melange we see uh, of agencies with different jurisdictions uh, when it comes to our food supply, of course, is the way in which Congress does business. The way in which we do business is, of course, endemic to a democratic society. When a crisis arises or when a problem arises, we say, let's fix that problem. And what you have, uh, if you will forgive the analogy, is some real sausage there. We've just, we've just packed, packed it in wherever we, it seemed to fit. Uh, and nobody sits, sits down and says, now let's do this in some rational way, even if we reorganize uh, our food, uh, our approach to uh, food safety, uh, we're likely to continue to do that. And I would only caution, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, we take a deep breath, learn from what is happening to the Homeland Security Department before we jump right back in with another whole big reorganization with all that that entails for employees and management alike. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Norton. We've been joined by our ranking member, Mr. Danny Davis. So I'll uh, yield to you for an opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and let me apologize for being late, but I was having difficulty pulling myself away from a very interesting uh, discussion of the effectiveness of drug treatment in another hearing, and uh, so I thank you for your, in your indulgence. Um, Madam Chairman, experts and Experts and members of Congress have long complained that there are jurisdictional overlaps within the executive branch, and as a result, some important federal missions slip through the cracks. Such complaints, however, go as far back as World War I, when calls for efficiency and economy in government led to efforts to strengthen the President's management ability. In 1932, for the purposes of reducing expenditures, and increasing efficiency in government, the President was given statutory authorization to issue executive orders proposing reorganization within the executive branch. A reorganization order became effective after 60 days unless either the House of Congress adopted a resolution of disapproval. Modification of the President's reorganization plan authority was made necessary in 1983 when the Supreme Court in the Chadha case effectively invalidated Congress's continued reliance upon a concurrent resolution to disapprove of a proposed plan. Currently, in the absence of reorganization plan authority, the President may propose executive branch reorganization through the normal legislative process. Calls to reorganize the federal government have more recently come from the National Commission on the public service. The commission, also known as the Volcker Commission, released a report in January 2003 that included the recommendation that the federal government be reorganized into a limited number of mission-related executive departments. The federal government's structure for regulating food safety is a prime example of federal agency mission and program overlap. Twelve different agencies administer as many as 35 laws that make up the federal food safety system. Two agencies account for most federal food safety spending and regulatory responsibilities. The Food Safety and Inspection Service within the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Food and Drug Administration within the Department of Health and Human Services. I look forward to hearing testimony from today's witnesses on how the federal food safety system should be reorganized and who should have the authority to affect the reorganization. So I thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Yield back the balance of my time and look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Are there any further opening statements? I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to submit written statements and questions for the hearing record, and that any answers to questions provided by the witnesses also be included in the record. Without objection, it is so ordered. 
I ask unanimous consent that the statement of the Grocery Manufacturers Association be included in the record, and without objection, it is so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all exhibits, documents, and other materials referred to by members and the witnesses may be included in the hearing record, and that all members be permitted to revise and extend their remarks. And without objection, it is so ordered. On the first panel, we're going to hear from Mr. Lawrence Dykeman, Director of Natural Resource National Resources and Environment at the General Accounting Office. Second, we will hear from Dr. Robert Brackett, Director of the Center for Food, and Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at the Food and Drug Administration. And finally, we will hear testimony from Dr. Merle Pearson from the United States Department of Agriculture. It is standard practice for this committee to administer the oath to all witnesses. And if all the witnesses on both the first and second panel would please stand, I will administer, administer the oath to all of you at one time. Anyone who's going to be testifying. If you'll please raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you will give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. And if the first panel would come forward and please be seated. We will begin with you, Mr. Dykeman, Director of National, Resor National, National Resources and Environment at the General Accounting Office. And uh, we do have your complete statement in the record, so if you'd like to summarize for five minutes, we would certainly appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, good afternoon, members. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the subcommittee's interest in streamlining the federal government. Today, I will highlight our considerable body of work on the federal food safety system and whether its current design provides sufficient protection for consumers while ensuring logical and effective government resources. In his September 2003 testimony before this subcommittee, the Comptroller General stressed the importance of beginning to take steps to achieve fundamental reorganization of the federal government into a limited number of mission-related executive departments. His testimony pointed out that redundant, unfocused, uncoordinated programs waste scarce resources, confuse and frustrate program customers, and limit overall program effectiveness. And as we've heard in the opening statements, our food supply is governed by a highly complex system, more than 30 laws administered by 12 various agencies and various departments. Now, the system is not a product of strategic design but rather it emerged piecemeal over many decades and, as was indicated, typically in response to particular health threats or economic crises. The result, in our opinion, is a fragmented legal and organizational structure that gives responsibility for food commodities to different agencies, and the, the real problem is it provides them with signif significantly different authorities and responsibilities. As we heard uh, in the opening statements, two principal food safety agencies involved are FDA and USDA, but many others are involved. And we have uh, a, a flip chart which shows the ever popular pizza, frozen pizza example. And if you look at the chart and you have it before you, multiple agencies yeah. regulate both the ingredients and the processing of the pies. And to complicate matters, it was mentioned that non-meat pizzas fall under one agency, FDA, while pizzas with meat toppings fall under USDA. Uh, as a result, some, some manufacturers, those with meat toppings, get inspected on a daily basis while others are inspected much less frequently. The fact that the frequency of inspection is not based on risk is really a very important but troubling distinction between the two agencies enabling legislation. USDA, by law, must maintain continuous inspection at slaughter facilities and visit each processing plant at least once a day. While FDA generally visits plants under its jurisdiction um, once every several years. Another problem with the food safety system is that federal resources are allocated on the basis of statutory requirements and not based on risk. And if, Catherine shows the next 
if you look at the pie charts there, you'll see that USDA and FDA, their funds are not proportionate to the amount of food produced uh, in terms of the food that they regulate. It's not proportionate to the level of consumption of these foods by the American consumers, or even more importantly, the frequency of foodborne illnesses associated with these products. And while USA regulates about 21 percent of the consumer food supply, its expenditures are about 50 percent more than FDA's. Now, our past work has chronicled these problems uh, with the current food safety system, uh, but I'd like to go into, and, and my full statement goes into more detail, but I'd like to touch on some highlights of some additional problems. Let's talk about egg safety, the overlapping responsibilities there. FDA regulates whole eggs, which are eggs in shells. USDA regulates egg products, which are liquid eggs or freeze-dried egg products mostly used for manufacturing. However, even though ten year, over 10 years has passed since the government is aware that salmonella <coughs> contamination from eggs poses a significant health risk, we still don't have a comprehensive federal egg safety uh, program. Another example with regard to health benefits that certain food products claim. Our work show that consumers face risk because current federal laws and agencies do not consistently ensure that these products are safe. Although health benefits may be treated, also health benefits may be treated differently by different agencies. We have three agencies involved with health, uh, with health claims. We have USDA, FDA, and the Federal Trade Commission. And this leads consumers to face a confusing array of decisions on health claims of certain products, and particularly uh, on the health claims of dietary supplements. Now, the same fragmented structure and this inconsistent uh, approach, unfortunately, is being used to ensure the safety of imported foods, which is an increasing part of the national diet. USDA must determine that foreign suppliers of meat and poultry products have food safety systems that are basically comparable to ours. We refer to that as equivalency agreements. While FDA, not having that authority, doesn't have similar requirements, and therefore it depends largely on port of entry inspections, which we have pointed out are not as effective. Let's look at livestock regulation. We've heard about uh, you know, the one case that we had in Washington on BSC and, and the Canadian case. And that's another example where you have USDA regulating the animal and the meat it produces, but FDA regulates the safety of the feed fed to the livestock. And we believe this can compromise our ability to protect uh, our citizens from animal diseases. Finally, po potentially an even more serious issue is that the current food safety system is further challenged by the realization that American farms and ranchers and our processed foods are in fact vulnerable to potential attack and deliberate contamination. As we recently reported to the Senate Committee on Government Affairs, bioterrorist attacks could be directed to many different targets in the farm to table continuum. This includes crops, livestock, food process, products, processing foods, transportation, storage facilities, and even uh, food and agricultural research laboratories. Now, while both FDA and USDA have taken steps to protect our food supply from uh, terrorist attack, we have to realize for the most part it's this antiquated system that we're talking about that we must depend on to prevent and respond to any such attacks. In conclusion, given the risk posed by the existing and the new threats that I spoke about, be they inadvertent or deliberate, we believe we can no longer afford this inconsistent overlapping uh, programs and this patchwork approach to food safety. It's time to ask whether a system that has developed piecemeal over many decades can efficiently and effectively respond to today's challenges. That's why we believe that creating a single food safety agency to administer a uniform risk-based inspection system is the most effective way to prevent and protect the nation's food supply. Uh, Madam Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions after the panel is completed. 
Thank you, Mr. Dykeman. Uh, second, uh, now we'll hear from Dr. Robert Brackett, Director of the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at the Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Brackett, you're recognized for five minutes. And again, we have your full statement for the record. So if you can summarize, it would be great. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Chairman Davis and members of the committee. I am Dr. Bob Brackett, Director of the Center for Food Safety uh, and Applied Nutrition at the uh, Food and Drug Administration uh, within the Department of Health and Human Services. And I am pleased to be here today uh, with my colleague from USDA, Dr. Merle Pearson, as well as Mr. Dykeman, to discuss the federal food safety system. And I do want to thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of <coughs> Health and Human Services. The subcommittee has expressed interest in the potential benefits of consolidating a number of food safety functions into a single food agency. Over the years, there has been much discussion about this. And in fact, in 2002, the White House looked into this issue and concluded that the goals of the administration are better advanced through enhanced interagency coordination rather than through development of legislation to create a single food agency. Uh, is the interagency coordination working? Well, yes, the American food supply continues to be among the safest of the world, and food safety agencies are working more closely than ever before. Of course, we continue to face many challenges. We face the traditional challenge of reducing the incidence of foodborne illness due to unconditional con or unintentional contamination. In addition, we now face a heightened challenge of protecting food from deliberate contamination. To address these issues, the Department of Health and Human Services has been implementing the most fundamental enhancements to, in our food safety and food defense activities in many years. FDA is the federal agency that regulates about 80% of the nation's food, everything we eat except for meat, poultry, and certain egg products, which are regulated by our partners at USDA. FDA's responsibility extends to live food animals and animal feed. Our sister public health agency in HHS, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, plays a very important and complementary role through its surveillance of illness associated with the entire food supply. Food safety and food defense continue to be top priorities for this administration. In our food safety and defense efforts, FDA has many partners, federal and state agencies, academia, and of course, industry. We're working closely with our federal partners, such as USDA, the Department of Homeland Security, the Homeland Security Council at the White House, and the Department of State, as well as with law enforcement and intelligence gathering agencies. I want to emphasize the close working relationship with the Food Safety and Inspection Service and the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services at USDA Customs and Border Protection at the Department of Homeland Security, and with our sister public health agencies, CDC and the National Institutes of Health. Specific examples of cooperative activities included uh, within HHS and USDA and the Environmental Protection Agency and other agencies that are working with DHS, Department of Homeland Security, to achieve the objectives of Homeland Security Presidential Directive 9, or HSPD 9, which has established a national policy to defend the agriculture and food system against terrorist attacks, major disasters, and emergencies. A second example is that FDA, CDC, and USDA worked together on Healthy People 2010 to identify the most significant preventable threats to health and to establish national goals to reduce these threats. FDA, CDC, and the Food Safety Inspection Service worked together on the food code to provide a model ordinance to local, state, and federal governmental bodies and tribal nations to ensure that the food provided by retail food establishments and institutions such as nursing homes is not a vector of communicable diseases. To increase laboratory surge capacity, FDA has worked with CDC and FIS to expand laboratory response network by establishing the food emergency response network to include substantial number of new laboratories capable of analyzing foods for agents of concern. These are just a few of the many uh, cooperative activities that we participate together on. Last July, former FDA Commissioner Mark McClellan issued a report to uh, Hum Health, and Human Secretary, Health and Human Services Secretary Tommy Thompson entitled, Ensuring the Safety and Security of the Nation's Food Supply. The report outlines a comprehensive 10-point program to protect the safety and security, now referred to as defense, of our food supply. I'll briefly describe three of the program areas. A key component of the FDA's strategic plan is to assure a high quality professional workforce. And so we're trying to create a stronger FDA. FDA has created many new human resource policies to attract and keep high caliber employees. 
A second point involves imports. Thanks to a bipartisan congressional support, a fiscal year 2002 supplemental appropriations en enabled FDA to hire over 800 employees. 635 of these were hired principally to address food safety and food defense issues, primarily at the borders. With these additional field employees, we've expanded FDA's presence at ports of entry, increased surveillance of imported foods, increased domestic inspections, and enhanced our laboratory analysis capacity. In addition, we're using risk management strategies to achieve the greatest food protection for our limited resources. The Bioterrorism Act provided the Secretary of Health and Human Services with new authorities to protect the nation's food supply against the threat of intentional contamination and other food-related emergencies. These new authorities will improve our ability to act quickly in responding to a threatened or actual terrorist attack, as well as other food-related emergencies. FDA has been working hard to implement this law effectively and efficiently. In conclusion, the Department of Health and Human Services is making tremendous progress in its ability to ensure the safety and defense of the nation's food supply. And due to the enhancements being made by FDA, CDC, and other agencies, and due to the close coordination between the federal food safety, public health, law enforcement, and intelligence gathering agencies, the United States food safety and defense system is stronger than ever before. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss Health and Human Services Food Safety and Defense activities, and I would be pleased to respond to any questions after the panel. Thank you, Dr. Brackett. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Merle Pearson with the uh, USDA. And Dr. Pearson, again, your full statement is in the record. If you would summarize in five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Chairwoman. You'll need to use the microphone, please. Uh, Madam Chairwoman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about, about the important issue of protecting the uh, nation's food supply. I'm Dr. Merle Pearson, Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety at USDA. Although I served in this capacity for only the past two years, my entire career, including 32 years at Virginia Tech, has been devoted to food safety and public health. First, let me offer a, a brief overview of the work and responsibilities of the Food Safety Inspection Service, or FSIS. FSIS operates under the legal and statutory authorities of the Federal Meat Inspection Act, the Poultry Products Inspection Act, and the Egg Products Inspection Act. Under these authorities, FSIS inspects all meat, poultry, and egg products sold in interstate commerce and reinspects imported products to ensure that they meet U.S. food safety standards. Ensuring the safety of meat, poultry, and egg products requires a strong, well-integrated infrastructure. In order to accomplish this, FSIS has a workforce of approximately 10,000 employees, which includes 7,600 uh, inspection personnel stationed in over 6,000 federally inspected meat, poultry, and egg products plants. Every single day, these plants are in operation. FSIS uh, jurisdiction encompasses over 45% of all foods produced by U.S. agriculture. The FSIS workforce verifies the processing of 43.6 billion pounds of red meat, 49.2 billion pounds of poultry, 3.7 billion pounds of liquid egg products. Uh, it certifies that these meet strict statutory requirements. In addition, 3.8 billion pounds of imported meat, poultry, and processed egg products were presented for entry into the United States from 28 of the 33 countries eligible to export in, in 2003. I welcome the discussion on the creation of a single food safety agency. As you and members of the subcommittee are aware, any food safety and security system must be able to meet current and future food safety and security challenges. In addition, I strongly believe that any effective food safety and security system must be rooted in public health and science. FSIS believes, and the GAO and National Academy of Sciences has agreed, that a critical component of the food safety system is a verifiable food safety inspection system that is both risk-based and science-based. A risk-based system allocates resources based on the greatest risks or hazards, while a science-based system takes these risks and hazards into account to develop science-based programs and policies. Thanks in part to the efforts by FSIS to follow the scientific approach in administering its food safety programs, the American public remains confident in the, food safety, or the safety of the U.S. food supply. Additionally, our efforts are paying off as seen by the decline in foodborne illness over the past six years. FSIS routinely communicates and coordinates with its sister public health agencies. 
cooperation, communication, and coordination are absolutely essential to effectively address public health issues. I'd like to point out a few of the many examples exemplifying these successful partnerships. FSIS works closely with the White House Homeland Security Council, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Health and Human Services, the USDA Homeland Security staff, and other federal, state, and local partners to develop and carry out strategies to protect the food supply from intentional attack. In December 2003, uh, there was the discovery of a single case of, of BSE in Washington State. And this provides an excellent example of the strong communication ties between USDA and its federal and state food safety partners. The federal government's swift response to the BSE diagnosis played a vital role in maintaining high consumer confidence. Since 1999, FSIS and FDA have had an MOU to exchange information on an ongoing basis about establishments that fall under both jurisdictions. Another example is the Codex Alimentarius Commission, which is a joint WHO-FAO international standard setting body for food safety. The USDA Undersecretary for Food Safety has responsibility for leadership of Codex with the United States government and the Codex office is managed through FSIS. Codex is an excellent example of wide-reaching coordination of food safety activities throughout the United States government. In considering a single food safety agent, agency, Congress must analyze the efficacy of the single food safety agency models in the countries that have adopted such paradigms while being mindful of the ultimate goal, improving food safety and public health. FSIS bases its policies decisions on science, so the single food safety agency discussion boils down to the question, will there be a measurable benefit to public health? As with any food safety, any food, new food safety and, and security effort, we want to make sure we maintain and continue improving on any progress that we have made to to uh, improve public health. We must also consider the costs associated with any major overhaul to the U.S. food safety inspection system. In addition, Congress would need to determine how current statutory authorities would be merged into a single food safety agency. The acts un under which uh, uh, the food safety inspection service operate uh, are, are different than the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, administered by the Food and Drug Administration. Under the acts FSIS administers, it must find product not adulterated before the product can enter commerce. This is because inherent in these acts is a finding by Congress that the risks presented by meat, poultry, and egg products are such that trained inspectors must affirm that these products are safe before they can enter commerce and be distributed to consumers. We are proud of our accomplishments, particularly the declines in foodborne illnesses over the past few years, and we must maintain and improve <coughs> on the progress that FSIS, FDA, and our food safety partners have uh, made thus far. Thank you for the opportunity to provide these overview comments of, on our food safety and security uh, programs. We look forward to working with Congress to continue to keep the nation's food, safety, food supply safe and secure and strengthen public health. And I certainly welcome any uh, questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pearson, and uh, thank all three of you. We are going to move now to the um, question and answer period, but I will say that we may very well be interrupted uh, for a series of, I believe, three votes, and we may have to ask for your indulgence to wait for us till we get back. Uh, I will yield now to my ranking member, uh, Danny Davis, for questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Madam Chairman, and, and I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Dykeman, GEO has widely reported and talked about the high number of federal employees that we can expect to retire over the next few years. Um, what impact would these retirements have on our ability to protect the nation's food services? And to your knowledge, uh, are the agencies, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Food and Drug Administration taking steps to address this probability? Uh, Mr. Davis, we haven't looked. We have not looked specifically at human resource management issues uh, at the inspection service at USDA or at FDA. But it is my understanding that, like other agencies, they face uh, aging uh, workforces, 
and um, the stress of, of, of trying to train their employees to keep them, their skill levels up and to transition to a new workforce. Uh, but we haven't specifically looked at the impact of uh, the aging workforce on the food safety agencies. Um, Drs. Brackett and Pearson both uh, in their testimony uh, talked about the, the, in 2002, the administration established the policy coordinating committee to look into the possibility of creating a single food agency. And it concluded that the goals of the administration are better advanced through enhanced agency coordination rather than creating a single agency. Um, do you agree or well, not I, agree I, with? I, I, with all due respect, uh, I, I, I could understand to some extent why the administration uh, would do that. It's, it's, it is difficult to bring about change. And unfortunately, it usually takes a crisis. In the food safety system, it might unfortunately take a health crisis, uh, a larger outbreak of mad cow disease or, or foot and mouth disease or something of that nature. Obviously, you can improve the effectiveness of any system where you have multiple operatives if you have improved coordination. But I think the, the question really should be, why do we have to rely on coordination just because we have players there? Why can't we reshuffle the deck and have a smaller deck so we don't have to rely on one agency talking to another agency? The, the issue of coordination obviously is important. And over the years, we have done some work that has questioned, in some, in some cases, the effectiveness of coordination. But I'm not here today to criticize FDA or USDA. I think I'm here today to talk about, does it make sense to have a single food safety agency? If we had to do it from scratch, if we just started today <coughs> and we had to do it from scratch, would we create the existing uh, organizational structure or would we create one agency? And you know, obviously, uh, the, lo the short answer to your question is, yeah, I can understand how the administration, how the administration uh, would like to improve coordination and not embark on a new reorganizational structure. But I think for the long term and for the, for the American people, it really pays to have one agency look at food safety for a lot of the reasons I outlined in my testimony. Dr. Pearson, Dr. Brackett, could, why do you think that there appear to be <coughs> so much resistance to, I mean, we know that agencies kind of grow up, I mean, and, and take on roles and responsibilities that are perhaps a little different than if we were to start something from scratch or had the opportunity to just kind of say, we're going to create X to take care of these needs. And, and, and so knowing that, um, do you have any ideas about why there seemed to be the reluctance to, to let something go and start something new? Uh, as, as I stated in my, my opening comments, is, is the, uh, you know, the, the, the baseline is protecting public health, and that, sh that should be our, our, you know, our, our main you know, concern, consideration. And uh, you know, we are certainly open and, and uh, willing to to have consideration, discussion, uh, you know, opportunities, uh, uh, you know, looked at in terms of, of how can we do what we're doing better, and again to enhance public health. So, it's not. I don't think it's something that is is, uh, you know, we're, we're close-minded about it, but but we're we're you know we're open to, to discussion and and uh, and to you know further doing the best job we can possibly do. I think we're we're totally devoted to, uh, um, you know, to to doing that. I might uh, also further state as, as an example is uh, there was a tremendous uh, undertaking in creating the Department of Homeland Security and uh, the President and Congress should be uh, applauded for that just absolutely major undertaking and, and uh, doing something very, very well and very, very successfully. Um, in, in doing so, uh, we still in, in USDA and other agencies have to work in a collaborative way. 
and we do very, very actively work in a collaborative way to address our, our issues and, and uh, to cooperate to assure that, you know, that, that the security of the American public is protected uh, due, to, due to potential threats. And so uh, the point I'm making is if one, let's say, creates a so-called single food safety agency, you still have to have collaboration, cooperation with other partners, other states, uh, you know, other governments, uh, so on and so forth, in order to make that, that effective. Thank you. Chairman Davis, I'd also, or excuse me, Congressman Davis, I would like to also uh, emphasize that the current structure results from the statutes that we are, that we must operate under. So even with the single food agency model, uh, you would still end up having two systems, one governing meats, poultry, and eggs, the others all the other foods. And so again, the coordination, the communication between these different groups that would, would uh, oversee those sorts of foods would still be critical and as critical as they are right now. Can, can I just add, uh, I should have probably added that it's not our intent to just simply create a single food safety agency. Uh, and I agree with uh, Dr. Brackett that doing that by itself wouldn't accomplish that much. What we're really talking about is looking at the underlying legislation, coming up with a single food safety model legislation that covers all food based on science and risk. The other thing, I, and then, uh, and you could even do that before you reorganize. And maybe you, you might find that it's not necessary to reorganize. You could just have a level playing field on the regulatory authorities of the agencies. But I, I do, do want to add something interesting. In our full testimony, we have a, a chart which shows that you know, we interviewed uh, senior, very senior, and one of them will testify, uh, former executives that worked at USDA, uh, even the former Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, and the, it, it's funny, when you, lose, when, you, when you leave the position, frequently your ideological uh, and your views on the subject change. And I, I believe on page 18 of a, a statement, a full statement, we indicate how these positions have changed. And most of the former executives that we spoke to do favor the, a consolidation. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, I'll now yield. We, we still have about 13 minutes. So if, if uh, Mr. Deal, if you, if you have questions you'd like to ask. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Um, I think it's interesting to note that, uh, as you indicate in your surveys of these officials, they all agree in consolidation. Um, we have the two heads of the two primary agencies here, and obviously there's always going to be the feeling and desire to protect what you already do because you feel you're doing it well. Uh, and I notice your recommendation is not specific as to where that consolidation should occur. Uh, is it inappropriate for me to ask you, uh, Mr. Steigman, whether or not uh, you uh, have a preference from the GAO perspective as to what agency, if any, and I noticed that only two of the ones you interviewed uh, said an independent agency should be created for that purpose, which is a minority position. Uh, I think most of us who are interested in downsizing government would say we don't need to create another agency. Uh, where would you think it would be most logically placed? And. Uh that, that's a, obviously a, 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 an interesting question, one that I've given a lot of thought to. I've testified on this issue before, and I've been asked this before, and I, I hope I'm consistent in my answers. Um, there are, first let me just start off by saying there are advantages and disadvantages with uh, creating it either in USDA or FDA. Our first preference would be a, a, an independent agency, but I recognize that creating another agency in this budgetary uh, crisis that we find ourselves might be very difficult. And so if, if you don't create an independent agency, the issue is of which of the two existing agencies. Now, USDA has, in my opinion, more expertise, has, uh, has, has, has more resources, and possibly one could argue more experience. They do, they do however, have a downside. Uh, th they promote agriculture. And one can perceive a possible conflict of interest. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that there is a real conflict of interest, but one can perceive that. Uh, on the other hand, FDA, with a much smaller staff, uh, 
one could argue that it is a health agency, and that's really what food safety should be about. Um, and so, you know, I could see transferring assets from one agency to another. So, uh, the the long answer is that I would lean if if we ha if I personally had to choose, putting it in FDA because it is a health agency, and because um, it um, it has. I think more scientific knowledge, and it is not a promotion agency, as agriculture is. I would but just, obviously, that's a congressional decision. I would just make one other further observation. One thing that all of your interviewees were consistent with is that there need to be legislative reform, that is and uh, I agree with that. I have some specifics that hopefully, in the maybe more appropriate in the next panel, we'll get a chance to discuss some of those specifics because, quite frankly, what we have done with legislative language in many cases is create a conflict between the agency that's required to certify food safety. We put barriers to their efforts to certify because of legislative language. And uh, the organic industry is one that comes to mind uh, right off the top because we are, on the one hand, allowing it to be touted as safer than everything else, and yet they are excluded from many of the inspection provisions that uh, are required uh, of others that produce mainline products that are not labeled with a label that is given the impression to the public, at least, is safer um, than, than other products. And that, I think, is primarily a legislative uh, problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, I realize we've got a vote going on. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Deal. If uh, you all will be patient with us, we do have three votes. Hopefully, we'll be back here around 415, hopefully. Um, but we will start the minute that I get back in here. And uh, is, is there any time constraints on anyone? All right. Thank you. With that, the uh, hearing is recessed. hearing will now come to order. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for your patience. Uh, Congress doesn't exactly do 15 minutes for 15 minutes. It's more like 25 minutes for 15 minutes. But uh, let me ask uh, a few questions. Mr. Dykeman, let me ask you, uh, would the consolidation of the, of the food inspection activities result in any savings for the taxpayer? In the short term, Probably no. There probably will be startup costs. Um, in the longer term, or the midterm, particularly, again, if we could have one uniform risk-based legislative uh, authority to cover food safety, I think we'd be able to reduce some inspections on foods that are not as high risk. And because inspections, particularly some of the USDA inspections, are fairly expensive on a product by product basis. And so we might be able to free up some of that inspection power and make it available for higher risk things or to some extent reduce uh, expenditures. But there are also other savings that can, um, uh, that, that can be achieved. You have <coughs> regional office structures in two agencies. And some of them, I, I think on average, are within 10 miles of one another. Uh, you have regulatory writing, you have enforcement, you have attorneys. So I, th I, I think there would be an economy of scale uh, if you would combine. Now, we haven't done uh, you know, specific work to look at the, some of the savings. And as you, as you know, Madam Chairwoman, we are continuing our review to look at some of these issues. Plus, we're also doing a review of, for the Senate Agriculture Committee to look at the experiences of some of the foreign, uh, some of the other nations that have consolidated uh, their agencies to see if they have tangible benefits, whether it's cost savings or reductions in illnesses or pathogen reductions. So, um, you know, it's an appropriate question to ask. 
Uh, right now, I can't assure you that there will be cost savings. Uh, I, I believe I can assure you that uh, there will be more e effective regulation uh, and you'll have a lot more latitude to spend the existing dollars that we spend. Uh, but I'm hopeful that there will be eventually cost savings. If we went the route of um, the legislative route to make it more consistent as opposed to consolidating and making one agency, would there be a savings then? There should be some savings, again, particularly in the inspection, reduction of inspections. Uh, if inspections were purely based on risk um, and not on legislative requirements, there should be some. But obviously, there are more opportunities if you can combine functions. Let me go to you. Uh, I think to you, Dr. Pearson, if my, if my memory serves me correct, based on something that you said on, on there being a, a cost to reorganize. Some believe that the um, the status quo is acceptable in the system because there's communication between the various agencies with food safety responsibilities. But wouldn't wouldn't the system um, be better served if 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 we spent more time and resources on enforcement as opposed to communication? Well, certainly. Number one is certainly certainly we we. Uh, Again, are very open to you know consideration of, of uh, our regulatory authorities and you know how we carry out our responsibilities. Um, whether or not there'd be specific uh, cost savings relative to, uh, uh, you know, I'm not even talking cost savings now. I'm talking wouldn't we be better served if if, if <coughs> one or more agencies, depending on whether you went legislative or into to one agency, wouldn't we be better served, the public, um, if we were concentrating on enforcement instead of worrying about FDA communicating with USDA? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, again, within, within our, our area of, of uh, responsibility, of course, our main focus is, in fact, enforcement. And uh, yes, there are certain areas where we do, in fact, have to uh, specifically collaborate, but I think these collaborations, in fact, even though you, you might be under one structure, would still have to, to occur. You know, you, you still have the boxes and lines and arrows to different areas, segments, et cetera. So it, it depend on how all this was set up, but there would still have to be collaboration between these areas. I mean, we, ha we have that within our own structure within FSIS. You know, different specific areas have to communicate with those, with those other areas and collaborate with them. You know, our our, uh, our policy labeling staff relative to field operations, uh, you know, in, in other examples where we have to have that, that continuing interaction. But our overall goal, of course, would be to, to focus on the major resources, and that's where our major resources are at, are, is in the inspection side of, of our agency. Well, I guess the one thing that concerns me on, on the, the whole issue of communication, and I think you guys are probably doing a very good job of it, and Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, I'm not attacking USDA or FDA. I'm just trying to make some sense out of where I know Congress has gotten us, not by any fault of yours. It's, it's by piecemeal legislation. But, you know, it's been said that when, when everyone's in charge, no one is in charge. And I guess that's my concern. You know, if, if we were to, um, you know, to have some problem or, or, or something and there's no one official who's in charge, uh, of, of all the food inspection, the responsibility gets scattered around to so many different agencies. And I mean, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you handle that? Uh, and and uh, that can be to any of you. Sure. I, I think that we, you know, through the collaboration that, that does in fact occur, that that responsibility is is um, is quite you know well well outlined. I and mean, there's many many examples. I and mean, Dr. Lester uh, Crawford, the acting commissioner of of FDA. Um, we, we work with him, you know, very closely, and we, we know, you know, who has responsibilities for, for different areas. I mean, very specifically, the, the, you know, the BSE issue that, that occurred. Um, you know, we, I think we all very well realized our, our areas of responsibility, and, and it was really, a, a, I think, an excellent example of a, a seamless interaction to, to address what was a major issue and, and, and to make sure that we, uh, you know, maintain consumer confidence relative to the safety of the food supply. But 
that effort to, took interaction between uh, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, uh, Food Safety Inspection Service, the Center for Veterinary Medicine, and so it was, you know, multiple uh, mission areas. And I think it worked in a, just an excellent, I say, as, as I said, a, a seamless uh, operation where we really understood those divisions of responsibilities. Well, I may come back with some other questions, but I want to get to to our other members here. But but and, and forgive me, but uh, yeah, so, someone testified and said that you know one of you is responsible for um, the, the 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 dairy and so forth, but the other is responsible for the grain. How do you then reconcile what I said in my opening statement? One does. Um, chicken soup and beef broth, and the other does chicken broth and beef soup. That that doesn't fall in line with anything I heard. So I mean, where's the area of responsibility there? I I guess I'm not even sure of the clear lines of responsibility. So I'm not sure how you all can keep it straight. But I want to go on to to the other members now. Mr. Deal, were you finished before we left? Yeah. Oh, okay. If you have a second go around, I'd like to ask we one quick question. Okay. Mr. Murphy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm I'm really confused uh, because it was your statement just about one group does beef soup, another one does beef broth, and one does chicken broth, the other one does chicken soup, one does frozen so you didn't manufactured even get it right. cheese pizza. What's that? You didn't even get it right. No, I didn't. <clears throat> the other one does frozen pizza manufacturing meat pizza. Is there an a, a difference between the level of job training requirements, education, anything between those who inspect cheese pizzas and those who inspect a pepperoni or sausage pizza? I didn't think so. <clears throat> when we, we talk about, oh, how about beef uh, broth and beef soup? I mean, why do we have to have two different groups inspecting those? Okay, I, I think in part some of this is, is uh, something that has evolved over the years, quite frankly, and, and sometimes... Well, and, and I'm a psychologist, and we always say one of the definitions of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. <laughs> yes. And it seems well, to fit in that category. Yeah. <clears throat> I, let me go to a statement uh, that, that you made, um, Mr. Brack Dr. Brackett. You said, should a single food agency be created, there may be a request to reallocate 635 field personnel to a newly formed agency. Such a reallocation would measurably diminish FDA's ability and efficiency to potentially address issues involving the safety and efficacy on on. Why would that, uh, why would we have to get, uh, reallocate 635 people if they're needed? <laughs> Uh, Congressman, I think the main reason why that would be necessary is actually, again, and a lot of this goes to the risk-based, if you have a uniform uh, inspection across all different commodities, uh, you would be taking for some areas to put them in another one as opposed to doing it uh, with a risk-based system where you are focusing specifically on those areas that are of the highest risk. But I don't understand why merging this into one agency, which would prevent you from making the kind of adjustments necessary to do it right. I mean, I, I don't think that's part of the discussion here is everybody do the same thing one way, but I would think the discussion is still to allow enough flexibility so that you could do the job. It would be. And, and again, this goes back to my earlier statement about uh, with the assumption that if you have the current statutory uh, structure, uh, you have all the meats, poultry, and egg products with uh, continuous inspection mandated as opposed to the FDA's uh, laws which require uh, a risk-based approach which is not continuous. So. Uh, you'd still have those commodities outside of meat, poultry, and egg products uh, that do not have the requirement for a continuous inspection together with those inspectors who must be in the meat, poultry, and egg plants. Uh, under well, why can't you make that adjustment? Why, why, why can't we design it so, I, mean, I think with, with some of these issues here, unless there's really a, an entirely different graduate degree required to inspect some one thing versus another. Uh, can't there be some overlap of, of t and cross-training of skills so they could look, I don't know, someone could check a couple things at the same time, beef broth, beef soup, sure. well, chicken and, in some and the cases, eggs, I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, Congressman Murphy, there are also uh, cases where this is being done now, and a good example might be a plant that produces a cheese pizza and a, a meat pepperoni pizza in which we have uh, a MOU with USDA mm -hmm. so that their inspectors are looking at everything. If they happen to see something related to the cheese pizzas, they have the authority to call us. We come in there, uh, and so they are eyes and ears. Call, call you and do what? To, to act upon the observations that they have made. On but they don't behalf. have the authority to take other actions, and they can simply say there's something wrong with the cheese here or, or the pizza here? Or that here. it perhaps was produced under unsanitary condition. But now, with the new Bioterrorism or Act, uh, that will allow us to uh, actually 
uh, give them that authority, and we are looking at that possibility of doing So they wouldn't have to call another layer of bureaucracy. Yes, Mr. Dickman. Uh, yeah, I, again, I, I want to emphasize that we're not calling for reorganization or consolidation first without looking at the basic underlying statutes. I think your assumptions are correct that it would make no sense to just reorganize with the same statutory uh, legislation requirements because that would tie up the flexibility that you would gain by a reorganization. So I think what we're talking about is looking at the enabling legislation, coming up with a uniform food safety piece of legislation, and then considering how best to reorganize. Do we know what the level of um, administrative costs are of having these multiple agencies? We, 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 have, we have issued a report, it's several years old, that documents the costs of each agency but what we have not done is to try to estimate what could be saved uh, uh, by consolidation. That, that's a little more difficult. Now, I, I might add that uh, uh, one of the countries that we, we will be looking at that did consolidate, they originally estimated, I think, a 7% um, initial startup cost, but they hoped to uh, save 13% in, in the midterm. And so th those are the types of things we will look at when we look at the foreign country experiences. So we might have some additional information on other countries' experiences with this issue. That would be helpful. Thank you, Madam Chair. If the Chair. gentleman would yield to me for just one second. And let me just be clear on the cheese and meat pizzas. And I think you said it depends that sometimes there's overlap if they did both at the factory. So am, do I take it to mean that you inspect it at the manufacturer? And if that's the case, I wouldn't think DiGiorno's has a cheese manufacturing plant and a meat manufacturing plant, do they? No. Don't most of the frozen pizzas, don't they do them all in one place? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chairman, they do do that. But what I'm saying is that those products that have a certain level of meat, that is such as a pepperoni pizzas, must be produced under continuous inspection. That is not the case with the cheese pizzas, which are under FDA authority. The other point that I omitted to uh, to say about the FDA inspectors is they often do have multiple responsibilities that they also may do uh, drugs, devices, uh, other regula FDA regulated products that in which case they would have to have significantly more education. Okay. I think you make the argument yourself for having one set of inspections because it, it bothers me a little bit that the cheese wouldn't be expect inspected very often but the meat is. I mean. You could do something to cheese as well as you could to meat, right? Uh, you could do something, and, and if it's intentional, that's a different story. But one of the reasons that, that we look at it this way, too, is risk-based inspection. Uh, cheese pizzas are typically not considered one of the higher-risk foods, and so it would uh, not necessarily get the same scrutiny that another high-risk product will, whereas uh, in the case of USDA, and I'll let Dr. Pearson talk, their product, uh, they don't have a choice. It must be done under continuous inspection. better already. I'm glad you do, Mr. Murphy, because I don't. <laughs> well, I actually don't feel better already. Yeah, I thought you were I being, I thought you were being a little facetious over yes. there. Okay. Uh, yes, correct. Uh, you know, for meat and poultry top pizzas, you know, the, the type of the thing that, that uh, Bob is talking about that they come under our, our authorities. I mean, that's our statutory authority for inspection on that particular case when it's uh, our inspector has to be there at least one one time during this the shifts during during the day at those operations slaughter operations our inspectors have to be there continuously so there's you know there's differences uh, on that but uh, yeah it's it's a uh, presence each day in those in those operations I've gone way over my time but mr. Dykeman's dying to say something yeah I really don't want to pick on the frozen pizza industry uh, I love it was pizza. just the easiest one to talk about right there, but, but I think there are more substantive issues in terms of, you know, the, the whole issue of whether meat has continuous inspection or should it have continuous inspection or not. But another issue, uh, you asked about uh, overlap and duplication in general. L let me give you an example. Uh, both USDA and FDA did risk assessments uh, because of bioterrorism and, and the like, and they did them independently. Both agencies did uh, issued guidelines to the, uh, to the industries that they regulate in terms of how to protect uh, for security issues. And they did those independently. And those are the types of issues that I think we're also talking about in terms of, you know, 
a, 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 a scale of, of efficiency that would be appropriate and would be achievable if you had one agency. Well, I started something here, Dr. Brackett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, the point I'd like to make a correction for the record, which is that the vulnerability assessments that USDA and FDA did were done collaboratively, yes. uh, sitting down together, going through the whole thing. The guidance documents were done separately because, again, of our constituencies and our knowledge of the com particular commodities. So USDA had one set for meat and poultry, and, US and FDA had some for our commodities. But that was mainly a, a means of communicating to our, our regulated constituency. Thank you. Um, Mr. Van Holland, uh, we'll yield to you for questions. Thank you. No, I'll just wait to hear the next round of testimony. Thank okay. you. Um, Mr. Davis, do you have any other questions? Well, I do indeed. Thank you, Madam <laughs> Chairman. Uh, uh, Dr. Pearson, I know that uh, Mr. Glickman, former Secretary of Agriculture, is going to testify on the next panel that due to a lack of resources, products on FDA's regulatory system do not undergo as thorough an inspection process as products under the U.S. Department of Agriculture's jurisdiction. My question is, how would coordination efforts address these concerns? And would Mr. Glickman's concerns be better addressed if one entity had <coughs> the resources and responsibilities for all of the inspections? I think it all, all boils down to, again, the, the, um, the issue of, of uh, statutory authorities. You know, what, what Congress has, has, uh, has uh, passed as, as the, uh, our, or the acts that under which we, we operate, and those provide that, you know, that basic difference, be, you know, basic differences between what FDA does and how they carry out their, you know, their, their functions and what we do is, is, is FSIS. You know, there's just certain fundamental requirements there that, uh, for our continuous inspection and our continuous presence. So, but would not the products require as much review or as much inspection? Inspection. I mean, would we say that because there's statutory authority? Yeah. Well, what what it, it, I think what you're what you're driving to is what you'd call a risk-based inspection system, yeah. and and you know that's that's something that we're. Um, we're working on very hard to how to prioritize those risks and where do we best place the resources, you know, in that food system, and um, and so we we uh, we're of course identifying you know what what are the risks and what at what point should these risks be best best controlled, and so uh, we uh, we want to deploy our inspection force, you know, redeploy the, the inspection force such that. That we do we do uh, address those priority issues, and certainly you know we need to uh, collaborate as the laws now exist with FDA and in, in those priorities. Uh, I, I give you an ex example is uh, um, you know the risk ranking that was uh, done in collaboration with FDA for Listeria monocytogenes, and you know we we address those areas with the highest. Uh, uh, risk and, for instance, on on our part, uh, specifically passed a, um, a, re a regulation that addressed Listeria monocytogenes and its control in uh, in uh, uh, ready-to-eat meat and poultry. And as a matter of fact, our regulatory compliance sampling is, is a result of that has shown uh, the significant uh, uh, you know reduction in terms of positive uh, ready-to-eat samples for Listeria monocytogenes. So. Yes, you know, it's an example of where, yes, there's collaboration, and we did our, our risk ranking and identified where the greatest risks are at and placed resources in that area. So the, you know, the type of model I believe you're, you're driving at is, is the same thing or the same direction we should be going to, and that's, wh that's where we're headed. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Deal? Thank you, ma'am. Um, Mr. Dykeman, in your report, uh, you talk about the area of uh, claims of health benefits, and you point out that uh, both the FDA, USDA, and the Federal Trade Commission all have that certifying responsibilities in varying degrees. I assume that's a function that you would also recommend be consolidated, and if so, do you have a preference as to where that consolidation should occur? Well, I, I, I think it would follow the, the same lines as where the inspection uh, activities would be consolidated. Um, the issue there is, 
again, different legislative responsibilities, different legislative authorities. Uh, again, w when we did our report on functional foods uh, and dietary supplements, we found, again, big differences between the legislative authorities that each agency has, and that accounts for the differences in, in the quality of or, or the types of, of claims that uh, different products can make, whether it's a dietary supplement, whether it's a food, whether it's a functional food. And so I would, I, I would say that it would f still follow wherever the inspection activities would go, uh, that agency should have the lead on that as well. Okay. Um, the reason that I think that is a little more difficult question is that there are certain certifications uh, both at the production level and at the processing level. And if you're only at the tail end of the system, it's pretty hard to verify oh. the claims that are inherent in the production phase of it. No, no question about that. And, and the inconsistencies that we found relate to the testing evidence that has to be presented by the manufacturer depending on the type of product that's involved. Okay. Let me go to the border situation. Um, we, are, we do have the border agency now that uh, has that, in, that responsibility. I believe USDA still continues, and I presume FDA has some responsibilities there, too. Um, is that a function of border inspection that could be consolidated? It, it appears to me that um, there could be some consolidation. Does it make a difference whether the product that is coming across the border is in the process stage versus the unprocessed stage? And how would that con kind of consolidation and under what agency would it take place? Yeah, Mr. Dill, you, uh, Representative Dill, you're getting into uh, a line of questioning that is appropriate, uh, but we haven't done the work to look at all the different factors. Uh, obviously, border inspections are different than food inspections at a plant. Um, and and, and then it could ver very well be that, and Homeland Security has responsibilities as well. So there, there's another agency involved. So I, I don't have the short answer for that question in terms of which is the most appropriate agency. It could be that the responsibilities, if you only take the inspection in food processing uh, facilities and consolidate that, it could very well be that we might decide to leave some other uh, responsibilities with the uh, current agencies. Um, back to my, and this is my final point, um, the difference between standards of production and standards at the processing stages. We have some legislative problems there, and I've used the organic industry as an example, and I think it's a classic example where we have, through the Organic Standards Board, given them authority to set certain standards, uh, but they're basically self-certifying. Uh, no pesticides, no, uh, no commercial fertilizers, no GMOs, et cetera but they have their own certifying agencies. And we, have, we found, as I was looking into it, uh, a dairy farmer whose wife was his certifying agent, that he'd complied. And if there is no testing at the processing stage to verify the things that are inherent in the production requirements, there is a huge inconsistency and I think uh, a quite, a, frankly, a, a misleading of the public and perhaps even uh, some safety factors that ought to be considered. So it's not a simple issue. And uh, I think it does require a comprehensive review of everything that we have out there. Um, once again, a piecemeal approach may not produce us any better results than our piecemeal approach we currently have. I, I agree with you. Uh, and I, what, I, what I would hope, though, is that at some point, and it may occur next month, next year, or in five years, that the Congress decides, well, the current system is not the best system, so let's begin. We have to begin somewhere. Let's put together a panel that not is going to decide whether or not we will consolidate, but how do we go about consolidating? Mm -hmm. What is the best way to uh, revise and to, and to restructure the current system, which is clearly a patchwork system? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Chairman. Mr. Murphy, do you have any other questions? Uh, yes, I just want to follow up on an area that has to do with how information is shared between all the agencies, <clears throat> for example, there's, are there alerts or communications and, and training that takes place between the agencies so people are going through the same training processes or does everybody have their own with, with training and how to do inspections? <clears throat> Any crossover there? Well, I'll, I'll let FDA and USDA respond if you want. 
Thank you. Well, as I mentioned earlier, because our inspectors do have so, uh, multiple authorities, they do get specialized training. Uh, and it may be different than that for uh, USDA, and I'll let Dr. Pearson talk about that, because uh, each of these commodities takes a special knowledge. But we do communicate directly, uh, calling each other. Uh, we know each other. Uh, when we have issues, we share them. Uh, we also serve on uh, committees together to look at the scientific <coughs> basis and the risk uh, rankings for the different uh, foods. Um, and in fact, uh, Dr. Pearson and I, Dr. Pearson is chair and I'm vice chair of uh, uh, the microbiological criteria for foods, which, in which we both use the scientific knowledge and share the scientific knowledge and issues with each other in deciding on what we're going to do. Uh, the, the training that we provide for our inspection force is, uh, of course, very specifically designed to, to, uh, to inspect relative to, to the meat and poultry as well as egg product inspection, you know, acts and, and you know, the, the regulations that we promulgate based, uh, you know, relative to those, those acts. And that would be, those would be fundamentally different, of course, than, than under the Federal Food, Drug, sure. and Cosmetic Act. So you have, you have to train according to those, those requirements. That's one. Sure. There are some basic, though, uh, uh, principles, quite frankly, that are similar, such as in the hazard analysis critical control point uh, uh, concept that's used for food safety management. Is that training done together between agencies uh, or is that separate? No, because they, they, ours under under the uh, USDA FSIS, all meat uh, and, and poultry plants must have, um, you know, developed and implemented uh, HACCP systems, and this uh, these HACCP systems, though, is that this uh, this rule is promulgated is, uh, um, of course, relative to our, our authorities too. Um, Whereas FDA, they, Bob could speak to it relative to, to seafood, for, for example. Um, so there are some, some differences, there are differences relative to the basic approach to inspection. Well, but me, there are commonalities, I agree. Mentioned, if I could briefly, though, is where you have this, this uh, dual jurisdiction issue that our, our inspectors are trained on that, you know, the, that, those overlap areas. Okay. Well, that's important to know that they can, they're capable of doing that. Also, is there any sharing of computer information, files, uh, data back and forth between agencies? Are the computers compatible in communicating that information back and forth between all these agencies? Well, as far as, as our inspection activities, I mean, we'd, uh, the, because of the different approach, I think that, we, that we, we don't have systems where we share such as that, but we, we do, in fact, when we work, for example, on, on risk assessments, you know, collaboration on risk assessments, we would share back and forth. Uh, but, I, but you have to share that in terms of producing a report and that it has to then, or does it, <clears throat> I mean, I'm thinking when you're dealing with whether it's the feed for uh, beef and uh, poultry and, uh, and, and also the uh, <clears throat> grains and, and et cetera, uh, whether it's in the early stages or it's in the processing, that if there's information that comes across in terms of risk alerts or <clears throat> management yeah. or training issues, that those would be shared across all the agencies. Does that happen, or is those those does that not occur? Well, you know, certainly in, in, in issues, we'll, we definitely notify one another. I, I, was, I was thinking of, of, of an example, for instance, in the school lunch programs. Uh, if in fact there's, a, there's an issue that that might occur, is that uh, there's a food and nutrition service under which that there's a responsibility. We work very closely with food and nutrition service. If in fact there's an unfortunate event of of a, a, a foodborne disease outbreak, and in fact that that we we then will then work in collaboration with FDA, you know when those involve potential FDA products. So there's you know there has to be a seamless operation to immediately share that information, uh, such that FDA uh, is is well aware of what's happening. As a matter of fact, we we end up doing that too very very closely in working with states. Well, I mean I mean given that it just seems to me to solidify the idea that um, <clears throat> if everybody's on the same mission yeah. and you have begin at least to have some ways of communicating between folks, I still don't understand why we need different agencies do it, but we'll, Dr. Yeah, I have a few oh, seconds okay. left. Go ahead. Thank you, Congressman Murphy. Yeah, we do have and are looking towards actually sharing real-time data. For instance, in the President's budget, there is a, a laboratory reporting system known as eLexNet that is going to serve as the platform for both USDA as well as FDA and state laboratories. So we are uh, cognizant of that and we are working towards that end. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, 
going to uh, move on to the second panel, but I just want to leave uh, Dr. Brackett and Dr. Pearson with this last question. If you were to uh, design our food inspection, food, food inspection agency today, would you use the uh, system that we have today? If not, why not? <laughs> you know, coming from an academic background, that's like a prelim question. Yeah, it's sort of a loaded <laughs> question. Thank you very much. <laughs> You know, before I came to to to, F, uh, to to USDA, I, you know, I thought, gee, wouldn't that be nice to consolidate into this into the single agency? But uh, after experiencing, uh, you know, the federal government, the federal government process, and the agency, I, I'm not trying to avoid you. Uh, Mary. Sure, you are, but it's okay. No, 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 no. But anyway, the uh, uh, what what I come out with is is that before we just jump into such a thing. You know, and before we consider such a thing, is we we have to make darn sure what we're doing is is the right thing, that we're protecting public health, and whatever that system might be, I think we have to build it upon assurance of public health, and you know the outcome if it's a single agency, if it's if it's such as we have now, if it's you know redoing the the acts, I mean, th let's let's you know, go one of those those directions, let's pursue one of those. But let's just not jump into it, uh, um, you know, with, without giving very careful thought and attention. I don't think you'll have any argument from me. I'm not one to want to jump into anything. Okay. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Pearson. That the, the critical thing is to maintain public health and to continue having the safest food system in the world that we do have now and we do enjoy. Uh, a single food safety system or one involving several different agencies or a number of different agencies are two different models that one could use. I think it would take a, a complete uh, forethinking of what uh, we would be losing with the current system versus what would we be gaining. Uh, the underlying statutes, as we've mentioned earlier, uh, to be sure that we don't lose public health, that we don't lose public trust. And uh, even though we have a number of different uh, agencies involved now, I, I prefer to think of it less as a fragmented system and more as a, as a tapestry. Well, with that, gentlemen, I, I want to thank you all for your patience and your understanding for being here today. And uh, um, I hope we didn't grill you too much. And I'm sure we'll have more questions as, as time goes on. I'd now like to invite our second panel of witnesses to please come forward to the witness table. First, we will open with a statement from the Honorable Dan Glickman, former Secretary of Agriculture and Member of Congress. Then we will hear from Caroline Smith DeWall, Director of Food Safety at the Center for Science and the Public Interest. And I want to thank you two as well for being so patient. Oops. Well, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Let me say that I spent 18 years in this body so you understand. And I also spent many times in this room, many hours in this room, which the Judiciary Committee had some of their subcommittees uh, operating under at times. So uh, to all of you here, uh, Mr. Murphy, who I don't know, but Mr. Deal, who I did serve with, uh, Mr. Davis, Mr. Van Hollen, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you know, I, now I'm at Harvard, not because I could get in, but Mr. Van Hollen was a good predecessor of mine. But I run a program there at the Kennedy School. and. Um, I'm a little bit probably less uh, partisan than I used to be. But this has been a terrific hearing, and I think everybody has asked amazing questions. One of the best hearings I've ever heard on food safety, and, and it's a pleasure to be here with my friend Caroline smith wall Let me just make a couple of comments. One of the big issues here is resources. USDA has all the resources. FDA has got a pittance of resources. And, you know, the, the truth of the matter is one of the problems is, is that they have probably more, USDA has probably more resources per problem than, you, than FDA does. So we have a misallocation of resources in terms of these issues. And one of the first things I would recommend to you is, is that, that there should be a, uh, the allocation of resources in food safety should be done on the basis of a comprehensive qualitative and quantitative risk assessment. And Mr. Murphy talked about this. To my knowledge, that has never been done. 
who does what in the federal government on food safety, what kind of resources they get, and what kind of public safety protection there is in there. You know, until you get to that, that question, you can't really decide how do you want to reorganize this stuff. I and mean, we can talk about pizza and chicken broth till we're blue in the face, but quite honestly, the real issue is the threats to the American people from contaminated and, and infected food. And we have never done that kind of assessment to figure out where the threats are, where the resources are. Maybe we have misallocated them dramatically. I suspect that we have. And that's one of the things that maybe we, I think that will take some legislation to do that, but that's something that I would recommend to you. The second thing is I believe that we need to consolidate desperately. I was secretary at a time when we had, we, we get, went through the HACCP program. We had a lot of food safety problems. It was after the Jack in the Box situation. It was before the BSE uh, issue, which, by the way, I think my successor has handled very, very well in quelling uh, uh, any kind of fears out there. But, you know, H.L. Mencken once said, for every complicated problem, there is a simple and a wrong solution. And I would like to tell you that this problem is simply solved by just creating a single food safety agency. But what happens to issues like GMOs, which we may, may be safety related or may be trade related? Sanitary and phytosanitary barriers of other countries, hormones, antibiotics. There are a whole litany of problems there that I suspect, while uh, we might be able to get a consensus in this room that are food safety related out in the countryside and among the constituency groups, I don't think that you could do that. On the other hand, if we were to start the system up today, as I think Mr. Davis and you, uh, Congresswoman, have suggested, it would never look like the system we have today. So let me tell you where I think we ought to start. We ought to start with the inspection functions. We have 10,000 or so inspectors uh, in the USDA or FSIA employees, and about 10% of that at the FDA. We have a misallocation of inspectors. One of the things I recommend you do is you look at this inspection force of food, and we try to consolidate that cons inspection force. Mr. Murphy talked about cross-training. Uh, we don't do any cross-training to speak of, really, quite honestly. It's very nominal. And we, we could, uh, as a first step towards consolidation, we could begin the process to cross-train and cross-deputize food safety employees so that they could do the various functions either at the border or at the meat and poultry plant or at an egg plant or at a pizza plant or wherever else it is. I suspect what you're going to find is the people are not necessarily, and the resources are not necessarily always where the threats are. Now, to do what even I'm talking about is no simple task. There are an awful lot of people have a stake in the status quo and don't want any changes in the system whatsoever. Some, of the, some employees, some companies, there are people who think the system is just fine the way it is. But we are bound to face more serious food safety threats in the future. And where I think you need to go down the road is to, to allocate and focus your attention what are the most serious food safety threats, which are both naturally occurring, uh, whether it's salmonella, E. coli, listeria, campylobacter, all of the basic threats that we know people uh, get, whether it's the unnaturally occurring terrorist type of or insidious type of activities, both in terms of internal processing plants and at our borders and then focus on what resources are there necessary to employ enough inspectors at every one of these places of high vulnerability and cross-train them, cross-deputize them, and they're probably going to have to ultimately be subject to one agency or a lead agency in that process. And whether that's USDA or FDA or somebody else, I think that that's the main road. If you wanted to really start out where the if you really want to protect the public interest, that's where I think you have to protect the public interest. Because if you have an inspection problem in South Florida or in, on the border in, in, on North Dakota or someplace else, and you don't have any FDA inspectors there or far too few USDA or some Homeland Security inspectors, and you want to get some others who are more in surplus position, we can't do that right now. We can't cross-deputize. Now, the states and the federal government have some memorandum of agreement, but I must disagree a little bit with both speakers who are here today. The truth of the matter is, is that there is no seamless structure between the agencies. I mean, everybody does their job the best they can. And by the way, most do a good job. Most employees are really hardworking and doing their best, but there is not m seamlessness there. And one, let's look at the recent BSE crisis, which was handled very, very well. 
Um, when there is a crisis at a national level, the agencies can usually get together pretty well. But on the day-to-day -day threats that occur, that's the, those are the problems that really worry me very, very much. So I would suggest that you look at the inspectors, focus on trying to consolidate their functions, and if necessary, make the statutory changes to do that, to give them the authority to, and this is going to take a few years, this is nothing that's going to happen overnight, and probably not get too hung up on one single food safety agency that you're going to end up with every trade problem in the history of the world, every every export import problem uh, all sorts of things that are perhaps not classic trade problems that we're going to find in that category that because of turf battles here in the congress because of problems with uh, industry and and employee groups are, you know are really never going to get solved one final point i would say is this is is that and again i want to say i think there have been better questions raised here in this hearing than i have heard in all the years that i was in usda on this particular point i would encourage you as members to be, one thing that always struck me about the FAA is the oversight over the FAA and the airline industry was impeccable in this country because one accident occurs and it's absolutely catastrophic usually. Not to mean that it's not perfect and the accidents have pr produced what I call a better federal oversight over safety issues. Even with airlines that are in problem areas financially you don't really worry about the fact that they're not doing the work that needs to be done. And I would encourage you in the Congress, and I encourage the White House, to give this matter of food safety oversight continuing attention and not just when there's a BSE crisis, because I'm telling you that's what, what happens here. Now, during the, I don't know if they've kept it up, during the Clinton administration we had the President's Council on Food Safety which had all the various agencies that would meet periodically. I don't know whether that has continued to meet or not. It should. And it ultimately may be that the president's going to have to designate an agency to kind of be in charge, at least uh, on paper, of all these kinds of situations. But I would also encourage the White House to have this constant level of engagement. These people are trying to do the best job that they can. Unfortunately, they couldn't answer your last question because it was a political question. And, you know, I, if I were them, I'd be scared to death to answer that kind of question as well. I didn't expect them to answer it. Right. But, but uh, what you've done is you've raised very, very good questions. This is a complicated issue. The science is evolving. The threats are evolving. The pathogens are evolving. They're even becoming more virulent all the time. And what you need is an inspection force, at least initially. It's a little bit like armed services. We need an inspec inspection force that's ready on the ground to protect the American people against the most basic threats there are. And then you move out after that to try to deal with perhaps some of the more comprehensive type problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate all your insight and all the years that uh, you were here to learn. Sometimes those years don't give you insight, but uh, I got the chance to say it anyway. Well, when you get outside, you get the insight. Right? <laughs> uh, Mr. Wall, thank you for your patience, and you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, and it's so hard to follow former Secretary Glickman. So I, um, I'm Director of Food Safety at the Center for Science in the Public Interest. I'm also a constituent of Representative Van Hollens, and I really appreciate the opportunity to testify today. CSPI is supported by 850,000 subscribers, and, and we accept no either government or industry money, which means our views can be very independent. Um, I've been monitoring this issue since 1997 and have been involved in the issues of food safety for well over a decade. Nearly 100 years ago, Congress passed the food safety laws that form the basis of government food inspection. Today, two government agencies inspect the food supply. USDA checks meat and poultry processors daily, including inspecting each individual carcass, meat or poultry carcass, individually. FDA, meanwhile, has authority for all other food products, including many high-risk products like seafood, fresh fruits and vegetables, and raw eggs, but manages this mandate on a shoestring budget. In 1997, the huge resource imbalance between FDA and USDA led CSPI to call on Congress to create a single independent food safety agency so that the government could apply resources more equitably to all the foods that pose the greatest risk to the public. In 1998, the National Academy of Sciences published a report that also called for consolidation of food safety responsibilities under a single statute, 
with a single budget and a single leader. This report, entitled Ensuring Safe Food from Production to Consumption, concluded that, quote, Current fragmented, the current fragmented regulatory structure is not well equipped to meet current challenges. Here are just a few examples. Food safety problems that start on the farm often fall through the cracks completely of agency jurisdiction. The same food processing plant may get two entirely different food inspections as we've seen with the pizza example. Quality inspections sometimes occur more frequently than safety inspections, as happens in the egg industry. New food safety programs like HACCP are implemented completely differently at USDA versus FDA. And multiple agencies may prolong the time that it takes to bring the benefits of new technologies to the consumer. Let me highlight a few other examples. One is that the coordination with the state agencies that handle food safety is literally a nightmare. State laboratories that analyze food samples for chemical or microbiological contamination, which are critical in our fight against bioterrorism, for example, these labs have complained about the lack of uniform testing methods and about inconsistent reporting requirements with the federal agencies, and they have to they have to provide samples to USDA, FDA, CDC, and EPA. And under the current structure, imported products are treated completely differently if they're regulated by FDA, which just does a border inspection, and USDA, which actually goes to the country. They approve the program. They approve each individual plant, and then they check 20 percent of the meat or poultry that's crossing the border. In a global marketplace, other countries are moving quickly to modernize their food safety programs. And the U.S. is falling behind, literally, when it comes to our mo having a modern food safety statute and mandate. Numerous countries have already created unified food safety agencies that cover the entire food supply. And in Europe, especially, this effort was driven by the BSE crisis. It's clearly not news to anyone that statutes designed when the Model T were being driven are not suited to address modern hazards. But make no mistake, if a terrorist were to strike the U.S. food supply, consumer confidence in the government's fractured food safety programs would plummet as fast as confidence in airport security did following September 11. Even Dr. John Baylor, the chairman of the National Academy of Sciences Committee calling for a more unified food safety structure, said that when, quote, when bioterrorism is added to the mix, the case for prompt and sweeping changes becomes compelling. While additional tinkering with the details of our food safety system may be helpful, the consolidation of responsibilities, authorities, and resources for food safety into a single high-level agency is critical. Today, a unified agency operating, operating under a modern food safety statute is truly an issue of national security. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Wall and uh, Secretary Glickman. Uh, we'll now go to the question and answer period, and I'll call on uh, Mr. Davis, our ranking member, for questions. Well, thank you very much, and I, too, want to thank the witnesses, especially for their patience. Um, Mr. Glickman, Dr. Brackett testified that the Department of Homeland Security is taking the lead in establishing national policy to defend the agriculture and foods systems against terrorism. However, you testified that the creation of DHS creates a disincentive for the Congress to make fundamental changes in the short term. Uh, DHS appears to be working collaboratively with the Department of Agriculture and the Food and Drug Administration to address food safety concerns as it pertains to terrorism. If DHS is actively involved in the process, do you still believe that Congress need to act in the short or the long term? Well, uh, first of all, I think that uh, my, my judgment is, is that uh, the jury is still out on DHS and what they're doing in the terror bioterrorism areas affects uh, food and agriculture. I mean, I think they're trying their best, but, but um, and I'm not privy to the systems that are going on there. but. But um, 
there has been an enormous amount of reorganization in the government as a result of DHS. For example, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service um, at USDA, which is the lead agency for basically inspecting imports of animal products, other food products, has seen its mission further divided as a result of the Department of Homeland Security. Some of their missions now in DHS, some of the mission remains in USDA. So in effect, what we have done as a part of that statute is further complexified it. That is, as opposed to consolidating, we've basically divided. And what it's done, I, I suspect if you talk to people in USDA, and maybe this is just temporary, is, is that it's created morale problems, and uh, it has not en enhanced uh, a lot of the feeling that uh, USDA is out there uh, largely promoting its own food safety functions. Uh, and that's to be, I, I assume that's to be expected because of what happened after 9-11. I, I, I guess my point is, is that the, the Department of Homeland Security is still feeling its own oats, and I'm not sure that is not interf going to interfere to some degree with the possibility of consolidating food safety functions because my guess is they're going to want to have more and more jurisdiction over these issues, not less and less. Thank you. Mr. Wall, how would you rate our system and, and the safeness of our system with that of other countries? Uh, well, I appreciate your question. I think we're blessed with a, a very safe food supply compared to many other regions of the world. That said, there is a lot we can improve. And unfortunately, our system, our fractured federal system, actually stands in the way of us correcting some well-known food safety problems. G our representative from GAO did mention the egg issue. We've known for, for almost 10 years that you could solve, uh, you could virtually eliminate illnesses from eggs by instituting on-farm controls. We've known that. We've had pilot studies. USDA ran them. They were very, very effective, and yet we don't have a regulation in place that actually implements them because it took them a bunch of years, actually, under the Clinton administration to just figure out who was in charge of eggs. Um, you know, one agency today regulates chickens, another regulates eggs, and a third regulates the meat from the chickens. And in almost every every problem, we end up with that kind of division where almost three agencies are involved. So um, I think that, you know, I think we have some areas of the food supply that are very safe, but other areas that desperately need improvement. If I, I just want to add one thing. One of the positive notes in all of this is large sectors of, of private food industry have actually moved ahead of the government in doing food inspection and setting up systems that are, are actually um, more stringent than what uh, either the FDA or F USDA requires. And that, that's a trend we've got to try to continue to encourage. Mr. Wong, could, could I infer that you're saying that it's really time to bite the bullet and, and go ahead and put in place a, an, an agency that has this responsibility. Exactly right. And I mean, the rest of the world is really moving ahead of us in this area. And you know, we're the US. We don't want to be behind in anything. So I really think it is time to bite the bullet and move forward. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, Mr. Murphy? Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome here. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm from Pennsylvania, and so your comments about the hepatitis A outbreak are particularly concerned to me. <clears throat> and I just want to follow up with regard to this. So uh, in your written testimony, you talk about how meat that come, that's imported <laughs> is inspected by the USDA at two points, once on site at the farm and once at a processing plant, and then maybe inspected again somewhere after that. <clears throat> but food that, uh, that comes in, excuse me, uh, plants that come in, vegetables that come in are only inspected once they reach this country and then only one to two percent? That's right. Now, of that 1 to 2 percent, if you have several hundred bushels coming from the same farm, does that mean that maybe a green onion or something, 1 or 2 percent of that particular farm is inspected, or it's just 1 or 2 percent of anything? And so a whole farm could go by with no inspection at all. Oh, in most cases, whole farms are going by and never being inspected. At FDA, they don't have authority to go to the foreign country to inspect. But to USDA does. USDA does. Why not? 
Uh, it goes back to these 100-year-old statutes okay. that were just designed differently. So even when there is an outbreak, it's tough to go get authority to go back and inspect the farm in Mexico, wherever that might be. They can't go unless <laughs> they're invited by <clears throat> the country. And uh, But USDA can go any time they want. If but clearly, there's, there's an arcane rule that needs to change to allow us to do that. Also, I, you were here before when I asked the question about communicating between agencies. Mm -hmm. Mr. Secretary, I'm, with your experience, I'm wondering what, if you can comment on that. Uh, because part of my sense is if Congress wants a question, we have to go to each agency and ask the same question, hoping they'll give it to us. But then we have to fit the pieces together after that. Is that your understanding? That's too? correct. In a, in a, uh, it's absolutely correct. Uh, in a crisis, the <coughs> agencies communicate rather well because usually the political pressures from the Congress are very great in the White House to get people together at the table at the same time. That's how this President's Council on Food Safety was ultimately created. But these processes don't seem to have any sustained life to them. So right after the BSE ec epidemic, which was, thank God, only one case in this country, is over, or the E. coli epidemic is over, we kind of go back to the way we were, everybody doing their own thing. Well, then let me add another layer to that. Then you have the State Departments, whether it's Department of Agriculture or Department of Health, also trying to coordinate it. My assumption is they also face the same dilemma. So if they're, like Pennsylvania, we have the... Uh, other issues with uh, poultry mm -hmm. uh, and concerns about uh, 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 flu there. Uh, and so they also then have to begin to talk to different agencies and coordinate them. But, but that's a day-to-day -day issue for, for them. Yes, actually, the FDA does have some agreements with states where they do, they have these collaborative agreements. One thing I would tell you is you may want to consider looking at the statutes to see if, in fact, the agencies are really authorized to have uh, collaborative or joint operating agreements. And I'm not sure they necessarily are. For example, USDA's Forest Service and the Department of Interior now operate under joint operating agreements with respect to some park and forest service facilities. And, and I, I, I'm not sure, if, 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 as a matter of fact, if there's different statutory formulas and bases, whether they can do that under current law. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Mr. Wall? About the, um FDA does have agreements, cooperative agreements, for the inspections by the states. And in fact, what we've seen over the years is more and more of the food safety inspections are actually being done at the state level. And so Pennsylvania probably has a very active inspection program at the state yeah. level. Pennsylvania also was where the pilot study was run, um, which showed that on-farm controls for salmonella in eggs was very effective. So the states are very active in this area, but they have trouble coordinating well, does, with the federal Does that government. information then go up to the federal level, and the federal people disseminate that to other states, or is that up to states to figure that out between themselves? Um, they, it's up to states to figure it out. And under, again, um, during a couple of years, during the 1990s, there was an effort to bring the states together with the federal government. But uh, in recent years, that effort's fallen apart. And I know the states are anxious to get it going again because they just need standards like consistent laboratory standards. And mm -hmm. they need a, a way to interact with the federal government that's much more streamlined. If, okay. if there's a public health or an imminent disease problem, the Centers for Disease Control is basically the agency of government that tries to coordinate all this, and therefore you've got another player in this game, which is CDC, which once there's an outbreak or once there's an epidemic, then they handle all the epidemiological data, all the transfer of information, all, a lot of the communications. So, uh, And they are very engaged, uh, by the way. I don't know what the resource needs are, but you can't really probably even consolidate a lot of these functions without considering what CDC's role is, because it's the disease prevention agency. But CDC then can't um, engage one of the federal agencies <coughs> until they know what food it is. So you have an outbreak going on, but they can't alert. They don't know which a federal agency to engage, because they don't know whether the food's regulated by USDA or FDA. Well, I appreciate the candor the two of you have brought uh, to this situation where it seems like there's a number of ongoing mistakes been made for decades. It reminds me of the Will Rogers quote where he says, um, good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that experience comes from bad judgment. My father used to tell me that all the time. Well, you learned that. well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Van Hollen? Well, thank you, Madam Chairman, and I want to thank both of uh, you for being here today. Uh, Secretary Glipman, thank you for your, your service, and uh, you're doing a, a good job from all reports up at the Kennedy School. And, Carolyn, thank you for, uh, let me turn that off. Looks like we may be having a vote soon. Uh, thank you for all you've done in this area over many, many years. I appreciate uh, uh, all your work in this area. 
I am just struck by the fact, Mr. Secretary, you started out by pointing out that we have this huge resource imbalance between USDA and FDA. Uh, then I turn to uh, Mr. Wall's testimony where she says in 1997 the huge resource imbalance between FDA and USDA led CSPI and other consumer organizations to call on Congress to create a single independent food safety agency and goes on to cite a 1998 National Academy of Sciences report. It does remind me of the other point you raised, which is that so often we respond to emergencies and there is a flurry of activity and very quickly the political momentum behind any change gets lost. And I think if there is one lesson that is coming out of the 9-11 Commission that can be generalized to all sorts of issues, which is where you have very credible evidence of a threat, it is important that we respond quickly and seriously uh, to it. So I hope that we will not wait for another food type emergency before we, we act on this issue. With respect to consolidation, I mean, there is one, one question that sort of we are dealing with all these budgets and resources that, that comes to mind, which is that are we talking about consolidating existing resources and better utilizing them, or in order to get the safety results that we need, are we going to, at the same time we consolidate, we are going to also have to add resources, manpower uh, to this issue. And if it is going to be a question of actually not just reorganizing, but uh, adding people, inspectors uh, to the process, has anybody, I haven't had a chance to look at the GAO report, has anyone taken a look at what additional manpower is required and what the, what the cost uh, would be to get the kind of system that we want that would really provide for food safety? Well, I think it is an excellent question. And I, I do not believe there has been in recent years an independent qualitative and quantitative risk assessment of food safety threats. So it is hard to really know how many inspectors we need. My judgment is we need more than we have overall. Although on the USDA side in terms of meat and poultry inspection because of all the new HACCP systems, in the future, we may not need quite as many there as we have in the past. That is controversial and a lot of people in the inspection community might disagree with me. But I suspect we need way more on the FDI's, FDA side of the picture and then you need to make the laws somewhat compatible in the process. But until you do that kind of assessment, you will never really know. Right. Yeah, we are actually working um, with uh, several members, uh, Representative DeLauro and Latham on this side and then uh, Rep Senator, Senator Durbin on the other side on um, looking at this question of how to develop a risk-based inspection system. So I hope that this committee would work with those members or, or tackle your own issue of how to create this, uh, this risk uh, this risk review so that we can get inspection that is risk based today. We have more inspectors inspecting chickens at a rate of 30 birds per minute than we have invested in any other area of food safety. And literally, we have government employees who sit at one point on a line and watch birds, chickens uh, plucked and, <laughs> and right. so, you know, broiler chickens fly by them. And I have seen it in action. It's, quite amazing, but it's amazing they can stay awake, too, right. because I, it's not an effective system. If I just may add just quickly, on the other hand, the new HACCP systems that are employed in many of the plants actually reduce that need uh, because they're a more science-based system and they work very well. And there are ways to, because a lot of the pathogens you can't physically see as they go by. You've got to test these products to see what's in there. Um, but one of the things I would warn you about, is, especially at USDA, the relationships between the inspectors and the management of the Food Safety Inspection Service is, shall I say, historically very unstable. And to go down this road, th there are a whole lot of labor management issues that are going to have to be addressed that are not going to be easy to tackle. Okay. Just one quick follow-up. You talked about chicken being one of the most inspected items. Seafood, on the other hand, I gather is one of the least inspected items, and that comes under FDA, I understand. And I think the HACCP, you know, the, the HACCP standards uh, for USDA with respect to poultry are very different and uneven compared to the fish. Could you just talk about seafood for a moment? Well, uh, seafood has been a, a fascinating issue. And actually, uh, when, when uh, 
Secretary Glickman was a member of the House of Representatives. He worked on a seafood inspection bill back in the early 1990s. But basically, well, meat and poultry are inspected every single day, regardless of whether it's pepperoni being chopped onto a pizza or a meat slaughter plant. Seafood, they've actually improved now. They're up to once a year for the highest risk seafood plants. So the bottom line is we have like products that pose a comparable risk but are inspected entirely differently. And the HACCP systems are also entirely differently because the agencies just don't have the same kind of legislative authority. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Hollen. I guess you, you heard we have bells and whistles going off because we have three more votes. And uh, I'm just going to ask you one quick question to you, Secretary Glickman. Why do you think, and this is an issue that has been studied for a long time uh, from what I'm gathering, why do you think any efforts to correct these deficiencies have uh, pretty much gone by the wayside and, and, and not brought any greater changes? Well, I think several reasons. It's a, it's a fundamental question. One, the system is generally safe. It can be made safer, but it's generally safe. Most people, and secondly, American people have confidence in the safety of the system. But keep in mind that, that the purview of this committee is reorganization, so we're looking for right. efficiency. But anyway, <coughs> um, that's okay. But you ask why hasn't anything right. been done? And I think one of the reasons it hasn't been done is because the public hasn't been clamoring for this with the exception of when there's a food safety crisis. And then you tend to gin up, there tends to be more interest, and it tends to come back down again. Uh, my own experience after serving in the Congress, frankly, is the turf divisions between various congressional committees have a lot to do with this issue. And um, uh, I don't know if they're still as profound as they once were, but I suspect they are. Every bit. And, and a fourth of all is, is that, by and large, the White House, previous White Houses, have not viewed food safety in the same general, same area as they have viewed, let's say, homeland security in recent years or terrorism or, or those k kinds of issues. I suspect you can do some consolidation and save some money. But I'll tell you, my judgment is ultimately we're going to have to spend more money in this issue, not less. It's just you'd like to have it spent on the inspectors out there in the field who are actually protecting the public interest. Right. Thank you both very much. And we will have some questions for the record that we will submit to you in writing. Uh, because rather than have you wait, we have three votes. Thank you. It could be 45 minutes or so. So uh, we will adjourn the hearing. And thank, thank you, you very both much. very much. Thank you. Hearing is adjourned. Next to House Subcommittee hearing on the